And the first part is titled uh, Forgiveness. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. The next part of our reading is titled The Parable of the Unforgiving Servant. And I might note that a talent uh, is a whole lot of money and a denarius is the usual day's wage for a laborer. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him his debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. And then this fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and, when he, and then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to, to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. This fall was a particularly special start to the school year for my family. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it, but this year my daughter becomes a, or is a senior in high school. And it just seems like yesterday that I was a senior in high school. I know it was 30 years ago, but it seems like yesterday. Some people say I still have the maturity of a senior in high school, but that's another story. And I have been in school forever, it seems like, and there is a lot I do miss about school. One thing I don't miss, I don't miss tests. And when I was thinking about this, I boiled all of the tests we take in school down to four types of tests. There's the true-false test. I like those. I had a 50-50 chance on that one. There's your multiple-choice test. I like those also because some of my guesses had to be right. There's the essay test, which actually was my favorite. I mean, if you gave me a topic, I could, um, well, I can't use that word. I could expound upon it <laughs> for a great length of time until I could fill that little blue composition book. But my least favorite type of test were, were the tests that contained word problems. You know the kind. At 10 a.m., train A leaves the station, and an hour later, train B leaves the same station on a parallel track. Train A is traveling at a constant speed of 60 miles per hour, and train B is traveling at a constant speed of 80 miles per hour. What time will train B pass train A? Of course, I give the uh, smart answer when train B catches train A. That's not the correct answer. Some of you may have already figured out in your head, the only thing I can think of, who cares? <laughs> I just want to know where they're going. And I love trains, so I want to know how I can get a ride. So, well, you know, just stick with me for a second because this does have something to do with the gospel lesson because our gospel lesson, circling them back around, our gospel lesson presents us with a word problem. In this account of the gospel, we kind of have to go back a little bit to last week. It's an extension of last week's 
um, scripture. And last week, Jesus was talking about forgiveness. And uh, when a member of the church sinned against you or did something that wronged or offended you, how you were supposed to work that out. And G, uh, Peter follows up that conversation by asking and wanting to know how many times he's supposed to forgive someone who's done him wrong. Now, he thinks he's being generous when he says, should I forgive them up to seven times? Because according to the rabbinical custom, you would forgive someone up to three times. So Peter's being generous. He's doubling that. He's adding one, probably because he knows seven is a perfect number and it's the number most associated with God. But Jesus says to him, no, not seven times, but 77 times. That's the word problem. How many times should I forgive? And, and Jesus doesn't answer the word problem. He answers it with another problem. Another math problem. He's saying, is it 77 times? Or the real translation, is it 70 times 7? Or 490 pronouncements of forgiveness? I mean, how many is it? How many times are we really supposed to forgive someone who has wronged us? I mean, I think Christians everywhere are dying to know, what are we supposed to do? This question pervades the heart of so many Christians that I know. It's kind of a checklist approach to faith. If we just stick close to the do's and stay far enough away from the don'ts, then we're going to be okay. But in fact, it's a trick question. Because this question has nothing to do with math. It's, it's about the very nature of forgiveness and about how we approach our relationship with Jesus and our relationship to our neighbors. And so to illustrate that point, Jesus shares the parable that we heard and we saw this morning about the unforgiving servant. In the parable, a tyrannical king, as we've heard, is owed 10,000 talents. That sounds like a lot. In fact, it isn't a lot. It's an enormously, or it's an impossibly ginormous, astronomically absurd amount. A single talent was the equivalent of 15 years of wages in first century Palestine. So the amount the servant owes is equivalent to 150,000 years of labor. So people hearing this parable and hearing Jesus say that would have literally laughed out loud at such a comically high amount. Jesus is, is working with the absurd almost in this situation because we know the servant can't pay it. No one can. And so when the servant asks for forgiveness, the ludicrous debt is forgiven. But then when the servant runs into someone else who owes him a hundred denarii, he demands that that other servant pays it off. And you may be expecting now at this time that a hundred denarii is a small amount of money, but in fact it isn't. As we heard, a single denarius was worth a day's wage, and so this servant owed about three months' wages. But I guess compared to 10,000 talents, it is a small amount. So the servant that was shown mercy doesn't show mercy in return and so he is sent off to be punished. As we explore this parable, we can find that there are really two important points to catch in it. The first, Jesus is saying, stop asking the questions like, how much should I forgive? Because if you're counting, then you're not really forgiving. But on the other hand, the parable isn't saying that we should just keep forgiving without thinking about it. After all, how can our heart truly be in something if we just keep hitting that forgive button and not even giving it a second thought? I mean, this entire exchange with Peter and the subsequent parable are invitations into a new way of living. Forgiveness is perhaps the most difficult practices of Christian discipleship. Forgiveness is a hard road to walk, but it is the way to life and life abundant. Forgiveness is the way of Jesus and the way of the cross. 
Now, at first glance, revenge seems so much easier and so much more desirable, but we're challenged to choose forgiveness. I mean, just as Jesus spoke words of forgiveness from the cross, pointing to a way that leads to life, we discover that at the heart of discipleship lies the painful and challenging choice to forgive. In relating this story, Jesus is holding up a mirror to reflect our tendency to withhold mercy and forgiveness that we've received. I mean, Jesus cries out, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. We cry out, pay me what you owe. I mean, it's sad that we forfeit the gift of freedom that forgiveness offers because we're unable to choose the spirit of love which forms us into a people who practice the abundant economy of forgiveness rather than the bankrupt market of vengeance. I mean, I know forgiveness is a hard choice. I mean, it may take months or years, countless tears and endless prayers to say those three words, I forgive you. But Jesus was clear, grace is costly and forgiveness is the currency. But I do want to be clear about what I'm talking about. Forgiveness is a choice. It's a discipline that is made possible only by the grace of God. It's not some heroic act of the will. It's, not, it's something that we are called to choose on a daily basis until it becomes a part of who we are. Also, forgiveness is not forgetting. You can't forgive something that you've forgotten. Forgiveness involves telling each other the painful truth, not to hold something over another person's head, but to find a way to break the cycle of the eye for an eye vengeance mentality in which we so often find ourselves trapped. Again, forgiveness isn't about becoming a doormat and relishing in the role of victim. It's about being victorious. Being freed from the horrible things that another person might have done to us. It's also not a strategy for turning friends into, or into enemies into our friends. Instead, it's a grateful response for what God has done in our own lives. We forgive others as a way of saying thank you to God who in Christ so generously forgave us. Practicing forgiveness also does not deny the possibility nor the necessity of justice. Rather, it redefines justice and ensures that it's God's peculiar brand of justice we're practicing and not the retribution and retaliation that is often masqueraded as justice in our society. I mean, think of it this way. Each week... We say the Lord's Prayer. And in the fifth petition, we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or other versions say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The version I like says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Any way you say it, this is a bold petition. Because we're asking God to treat us just as we treat other people. Do we really want that? Are we really ready to be as lavish with our forgiveness as we want God to be lavishing when God forgives us our sins? Well, you get to choose. I mean, Jesus offers the solution. He captures it well at the end of the passage when he says, forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Jesus is challenging us to make this choice repeatedly until it just becomes a part of our DNA. Yes, forgiveness is difficult, but seeing ourselves as sinners who receive forgiveness from our loving God is also difficult. I mean, it's much easier to hold a grudge than to feel compassion toward the people who have hurt, hurt us. But I think 
as C.S. Lewis put it, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. You can't go wrong ending on a quote from that guy. So let us pray.